Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Shatta. Happy New Year to all of you. I hope you've had a good weekend and a visit to the gym because memberships and memes have shot up. They shoot up with the beginning of the new year. Uh, some of us call it resolutions. Others just, just make a mental note or harbor a vague hope to score better on the pedometer or the weighing scale or the report card or the appraisal letter, whatever it is that works for you. We hope the year ahead is fulfilling. If you're watching us from Japan, we know you've had a rough start. An earthquake measuring 7.8 and a tsunami warning. We hope you're safe. If you're in China, your president has made a rare admission. The economy is in trouble. Xi Jinping has said that. If you're in India, you'll fare better on the economy front, but jobs will remain a worry. We look at the forecasts and the trends. In Bangladesh, elections have been hit by deep fakes. In Malaysia, McDonald's has filed a case over the Israel-Gaza war. In the Russia-Ukraine war, attacks have intensified. In Pakistan, 90% of the opposition has been disqualified from the election on moral grounds. So I guess the calendar may have changed, but it sounds like the same old chaotic world. We'll bring you all these stories and more. The headlines first. Kim Jong-un threatens to annihilate South Korea and the US. The North Korean leader orders his military to use maximum force against any provocation. Seoul and Washington have ramped up their defense cooperation. Last year, Pyongyang conducted a record number of weapons tests. Israeli army says the Gaza war will continue throughout 2024. Israel launched its offensive after Hamas's terror attack on the 7th of October. Nearly 22,000 people have died in Gaza so far, many of them women and children. The Netanyahu government has resisted international calls for a ceasefire. Nobel Peace Laureate Mohammed Yunus is convicted in Bangladesh. A court in Dhaka sentences him to six months of simple imprisonment. The Nobel winner who was granted bail, is accused of violating the country's labour laws. Guinea's junta to hold a referendum this year for a new constitution. It's a key step towards the return of civilian rule. In 2021, the junta overthrew the country's first democratically elected president. No date has been announced for the referendum. India records its highest ever domestic air traffic in December. 13.8 million passengers travelled last month. This surpasses the previous high, which was recorded in May 2023. And David Warner retires from One Day Internationals. The Australian opener announced his decision ahead of his final test match. But Wa Warner has kept the door open to play in the 2025 Champions Trophy. Wow. Wow. It's a scary start to 2024 in Japan. This evening, a series of earthquakes hit the country, at least 50 of them, 5 0, 50 earthquakes. The biggest impact was in central Japan in a province called Ishikawa. There, the earthquake measured 7.6 on the Richter scale. That was the magnitude, 7.6, which is pretty strong. Now, the tremors have stopped, but one major worry still remains that of a tsunami. Japan has started evacuating coastal areas. They've also issued a major tsunami alert, and this alert is important. The last time it was issued was in 2011, more than a decade ago. Again, after an earthquake, it led to the Fukushima nuclear disaster. So how bad is the situation this time, and what do the next few hours look like? 
Let's follow the timeline. The earthquake struck around 4 p.m. Japanese time. Soon videos emerged on social media. Take a look at this. Pictures look very dramatic. What about the damages? Nothing worrying so far. Six people are trapped under, under the rubble, but so far not a single death. Some roads appear to have cracked during the quake, plus a fire broke out in uh, Wajima city. Injuries too are limited. Most cases involve just broken bones. But the earthquake has cut off power supply. Some 34,000 homes are without electricity. It is not an ideal situation, but after a 7.6 quake, you would take it. The problem is, the trouble isn't over. Earthquakes can cause tsunamis, especially if they're large and close to the sea. So Japan has issued a tsunami alert. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has asked people to evacuate. First of all, I would like to ask all residents to continue to pay close attention to the occurrence of this strong earthquake. If you are in a region where a tsunami is expected, please evacuate as soon as possible. The warning isn't for everyone though, it's for residents living along the Sea of Japan coast. The highest warning is here. Noto Peninsula in the Ishikawa province. Officials warned of 16 feet high waves. 16 feet, thankfully. We haven't seen such tsunamis yet, but smaller waves have been spotted. Take a look at this now. And it's not just Japan. Tsunami alerts have been issued in South Korea, North Korea and parts of Russia too. For now, things are under control, but officials are not taking any chances. Motorways in Ishikawa have been shut, bullet trains have been suspended and the evacuations continue. It is the right call. Japan has recorded 143 tsunamis in the last 1,000 years. Put together, they've claimed 130,000 lives, 1,30,000. In 2011, it also caused a nuclear disaster, the one at Fukushima. Even this time, there are similar worries. But Japan says the nuclear facilities are all under control. Beginning with the Shika nuclear power plant, there are currently no reported irregularities with nuclear power plants. The next couple of hours will be crucial. Officials have warned of aftershocks. It could determine the final scale of the disaster. But let's ask the obvious question. Why Japan? Why do earthquakes keep, keep battering this country? The answer in one word is the location. Japan is located on the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's a tectonic minefield. Below Japan, around four tectonic plates intersect. The Pacific, the North American, the Eurasian, and the Filipino. Now think of these, these plates as giant slabs of rock. These four plates, their boundaries are right below Japan. So what happens when these plates move? They collide with each other. And when they collide, they cause tremors. If those tremors are on land, you see earthquakes. If it's underwater, it could cause a tsunami. Japan has adapted to live in this precarious location. Most buildings in the country can withstand earthquakes, including houses, hospitals and schools. The designs and materials are strictly regulated. Plus, disaster readiness is taught at a young age. You can see earthquake drills in most Japanese schools. They take this very seriously. I guess the point is, they're always prepared. You cannot predict tremors, but you can always be prepared for them. That is Japan's mantra. Just compare Japan's experience to Turkey last year. 
Turkey was hit by an earthquake measuring 7.8 on the Richter scale, magnitude 7.8. Buildings fell like dominoes. Tens of thousands of people died. Japan has been hit by a 7.6 magnitude earthquake, but the initial assessment is no widespread damage. So the Japanese mantra works. Tsunamis are a different matter though. You cannot prepare against a wall of water. Let's hope things do not come to that. Now let's tell you about the Red Sea crisis. It is escalating. Yesterday, the U.S. drew blood. American forces killed 10 Houthi rebels. Now the Houthis, as you would know, are based in Yemen. They've been attacking ships going through the Red Sea. They say this is in solidarity with the people of Gaza. That's why the Houthis are attacking. But they're attacking all kinds of vessels, even those which are unrelated to the conflict. And the same happened this weekend. The Houthis targeted a cargo ship. It's called the Maersk Hangzhou, a ship registered to Singapore, operated by the Danish shipping giant Maersk. Now, this ship has no ties to Israel, but the Houthis attacked it anyway. The raid began on Saturday. The ship was targeted with missiles. One missile was fired from the Yemeni mainland. It hit the ship, but did not cause too much damage. There were no casualties, and the ship could still sail. So it continued along the Red Sea. The ship kept moving. Then it was fired on again. Two more missiles were fired, aimed at the same ship on Saturday night. They did not hit their target, though, because these missiles were intercepted by the Americans. You see, right after the first attack, the first missile attack, the ship had sent out an SOS, a distress call. And this call was answered by the U.S., by one of their most potent naval vessels, the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower aircraft carrier. It responded to the SOS call from the cargo ship. Now, an aircraft carrier does not travel alone. It moves in a fleet along with destroyers and carriers. So the entire fleet went to rescue the cargo ship. And a destroyer intercepted the Houthi missiles, and the aircraft carrier launched helicopters to protect the ship. Now, the missiles may have failed, but the carrier was still under attack by Houthi militants on small boats. The Houthis attacked the American aircraft carrier. The Houthis had sent four boats to intercept and board the merchant ship, the cargo ship. They wanted to intercept and board it, so they sent four boats. But they were not prepared to deal with American firepower. Reports say the Houthis were only carrying small arms. But when they saw the Americans, they still attacked. They fired at the incoming American choppers. And that's when the U.S. fired back. The American enemy forces attacked three boats belonging to the Yemeni naval forces, which led to the martyrdom and loss of ten members of the naval forces. Three of the Houthi boats were destroyed. The fourth one retreated and managed to escape. The Houthis have vowed that there will be a response. The American enemy bears the consequences of this crime, and its repercussions. The Americans may have a target on their backs now, from the Houthis and their allies, Iran, because Iran, too, has sent a ship, a ship to the Red Sea, a frigate called the Al Bors. Now, this ship is old. It was commissioned back in 1971, but it has been modernized, and it can pack a punch. This is likely to complicate things in the Red Sea and make it harder for the U.S. to secure this vital shipping lane. Even though on paper, the Albors cannot match the USS Eisenhower and its fleet. The Eisenhower was initially sent to this area, to the Mediterranean, when the Israel-Hamas war broke out. It was supposed to be a statement, a show of force. The carrier and its fleet are more than a match for the Houthis. But shipping companies are still worried. Take Maersk, for instance. It had resumed shipping through the Red Sea last week, but now it has decided to stop using this route again. It needs more security and safety guarantees. And the U.S. has been trying to reassure shipping firms, trying to tell them that they've got the Red Sea covered. But one aircraft carrier may not be enough to protect everyone. So the U.S. has also formed a coalition to protect the region. It's called Operation Prosperity Guardian. About 20 countries are participating in this mission. Fun fact, 
About half of them have not even volunteered their names. They don't want to be publicly known as supporting the U.S., which seriously complicates matters. And Iran's entry into the Red Sea makes things worse. It has turned the already volatile area into a powder keg. And all this won't help reassure the shipping companies. Meanwhile, India too is stepping up its naval patrols. India has deployed more ships to the Arabian Sea. India now has four destroyers and a frigate patrolling the crucial waterways. It will also have aircraft and drones conducting aerial surveillance. The goal is clear, to gather intelligence and render assistance to merchant vessels. But India won't be shooting down raiders. It will ensure that no one gets hurt working in tandem with the US-led mission to bring stability to the Red Sea, to ensure that this key trade route remains open. Because a crisis in the Red Sea will hurt everyone. Earthquakes, tsunamis, wars, ours is a world of uncertainties and uncertainty is the enemy of business. So I guess on day one of 2024, the question to ask is this, what will this year bring for the economy, the Indian economy in particular? Tonight, we look at the numbers, the trends and the projections. The last year had its share of shocks, but India remained resilient. It was the world's fastest growing major economy. Growth remained steady. Inflation was a worry for a while, but it's largely been contained. And the year ahead looks good. Let's start with the basic indicators. How are the growth numbers looking for India? Positive. By all indications, India will maintain its growth momentum. I have three projections, in fact, from leading financial institutions. The International Monetary Fund, or the IMF. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD. And the World Bank. Now, all three agencies forecast strong growth for India. They say India's growth rate will be above 6%. For the third straight year, India will remain the world's fastest growing major economy, faring way better than most others. And what's driving this growth? Domestic demand, it is high, and foreign investment is rising. FDI or, the, or foreign direct investment in India rose to a 21-month high. It almost touched $6 billion in October 2023. The stock markets are breaking records. We told you about this last week. 2023 was a banner year for Indian stocks. They crossed the $4 trillion mark, making India a stock market superpower. So that's a vote of confidence in Indian corporates. The rupee remains largely stable. Foreign reserves have also shot up. India's Reserve Bank now holds more than $620 billion in its coffers. Again, this is a 21-month high. $620 billion. Why does this matter? Because high reserves are like an insurance policy against external shocks. They act like a cushion, sort of like an emergency fund. And this is a fund uh, that countries can use during a crisis. So India's current reserves can cover more than 10 months of imports and 96% of its external debt till June 2023. So net net, the fundamentals are strong, which is not to say that there are no challenges. There are challenges. The first one, of course, is jobs. It is a sore point. The last year was the year of layoffs. In November 2023, the unemployment rate was at 9.2%. The tech sector has seen the worst bloodbath. More than 200,000 techies lost their jobs last year. That's 40% more than 2022. Even in the final days of 2023, companies were announcing layoffs. A few days ago, Paytm sacked 1,000 employees. What explains these waves of sackings? Most companies are looking to cut costs and reduce their workforce. New innovations like AI are also a factor. So will the year ahead be better for the job market in India? The disruption is expected to continue, but new jobs will also be generated slowly and une une unevenly though. Indian corporates are looking to hire. Going by one claim, about 3.9 million jobs will be added in the next few months. And they'll mostly be in two sectors, logistics and mobility. They're seeing the maximum demand, so they will add jobs. But 3.9 million would be barely scratching the surface. India needs many more jobs. And it remains a serious challenge. Plus, there are external challenges like global conflicts, especially the one in West Asia. It could have a direct impact on inflation. 
Imports could become costlier. Exporters may struggle to move their goods. So far, the impact has been contained and limited. And in recent years, we've seen this. India has demonstrated remarkable resilience. The world has witnessed unprecedented events and a series of crises. A once-in-a-century pandemic, two unexpected conflicts, an economic slowdown, and geopolitical pressures. We've seen all of it. Throughout, India has managed the shocks and kept growing in a tough environment. He is hoping that 2024 is even better. Guess who's kicking off 2024 on a gloomy note? Xi Jinping. Every year he gives a speech on New Year's Eve, usually filled with positives. But yesterday's speech was an exception. The Chinese president made a rare admission. He said China's economy is not doing well. Some companies are facing operating pressure. Some people are encountering difficulties in employment and living conditions. And natural disasters such as floods, typhoons and earthquakes have occurred in some places. All of these things concern me greatly. Some enterprises had a tough time. Some people had difficulty finding jobs and meeting basic needs. All these remain at the forefront of my mind. Now, Xi Jinping rarely talks about China's troubles openly. And look at the timing of these remarks. Chinese censors are suppressing all negative news. It hasn't helped, though. The firewalls have been breached. There is an endless stream of bad news in China. Even on the day of Xi Jinping's speech, there were more troub troubling updates. A survey was published. It revealed the state of Chinese factories and they're not doing well. Factory activity in China has declined. It has dropped to a six-month low. Do you know what that means? It means manufacturing is weak. There is less demand. And business for Chinese factories has slowed. What about exports? In December 2023, there was an uptick. But it wasn't good enough. Exports increased by just 0.5%, which is as good as nothing. And these are signs of trouble. Trouble that is difficult to hide and almost impossible to ignore now. The Chinese are feeling this slowdown. There are reports of protests. Let me show you some numbers. By November 2023, there were over 1,700 protests in China, 1,700. All of them linked to the property sector. Two-thirds of the protests were against builders. Real estate companies, protesters were unhappy because of delays, contract violations, fraud and shoddy work. The other set of protesters were construction workers. They haven't been paid for months in some cases. Most of these agitations were held in public places like the sales office of the developer or a local government office. That's where they protested. People showed up with banners. They raised their voice. In some cases, they left after a few hours. In others, they stay put for the whole day refusing to budge until they got some kind of assurance. Do you know why this is noteworthy? Because public protests are not common in China and thousands of them even more so. This is a sign of widespread discontent and a warning to the Communist Party of China. The party does not like being challenged or questioned. Perhaps that is why Xi Jinping was forced to speak about the economic troubles. And look at the choice of words. Referring to China's troubles, the president said, and I'm quoting, all these remain at the forefront of my mind. This is meant to be a word of reassurance, that he's thinking about it. That's what Xi Jinping is telling his people, that he's thinking about the economy. What he's not telling them is, how will he fix it? And while the economy may be on the forefront of, of his mind, as he puts it, it's not the only thing. There's Taiwan too. It goes to polls in a few days from now, and the Chinese president had this message for Taipei. The reunification of the motherland is a historical inevitability. Compatriots on both sides of the Taiwan Strait should be bound by a common sense of purpose and share in the glory of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Reunification with Taiwan is inevitable, he says. Now, Xi Jinping has used this word before, inevitable. What's different this time is the tone, sharper compared to last year. In his last speech, Xi referred to the Taiwanese as, and I'm quoting, members of the same family. This time, he was more confrontational. He's using words like compatriots and historical inevitability. He said, and I'm quoting again, China will surely be reunified. 
And that's his ultimate goal, reunification, a goal so important that he's willing to use force for it. So this statement is like a not so subtle reminder for Taipei. They go to polls on the 13th of January, and China is saying that this election in Taiwan is a choice between war and peace. It has doubled down on the pressure tactics. It has tried to meddle in the Taiwan election. The threats are likely to continue, but will the result lead to a war? Xi Jinping has not given a timeline. As of today, he's not looking to pick a fight with the U.S. Because if he attacks Taiwan, the U.S. is going to get involved. He had a message for Joe Biden, too. He's willing to work with the American president. So in this case, his tone is conciliatory, and it makes sense. Xi Jinping needs to revive the economy of China before picking up a fight. But he will keep Taiwan on tenterhooks. We are now days away from elections in Bangladesh. It's the first big one of this year, 2024, it's, and it's no ordinary election. The opposition is not contesting this time, so Sheikh Hasina is all set to win again. It's a question of how many seats she will get. But tonight we're not focusing on the politics. We're focusing on a new issue here. The issue of artificial intelligence and elections. Apparently, it's a problem in Bangladesh. AI is being used to spread fake news. Take a look at this. U.S. Embassy statement in favor of Odhi Kaur's Adalur prove their involvement in the incident. After Hefazat mayhem in 2013, Adalur Rahman spread out riots in the country by disseminating false information. Now the U.S. Embassy's press release and tweet for Odhi Kaur and Adalur prove that they were also involved in the May 5 violence. That was not a real news anchor. That was an AI-generated avatar. You can hire him for $24 per month. That's all, $24 a month. You can make him say whatever you like. In this case, the AI anchor was talking about riots in Bangladesh. Do you know who he's blaming for it? The United States. Now, Washington has meddled in Dhaka. They have lectured Bangladesh's politicians and poll body. But starting riots is a stretch. It's speculation at best, dangerous fake news at worst. And this is just one example. Multiple deep fakes and AI clips are circulating in Bangladesh. One of them features an opposition leader. His name is Tariq Rehman. He's a member of the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. In this video, he says the party should be quiet about Gaza, basically not criticize Israel's war. And that's very controversial in Bangladesh. This is a Muslim country with firm pro-Palestine sentiments. So being silent on Gaza is political suicide in Bangladesh. Then why did Tariq Rahman say it? Well, that's the thing. He did not. The video was a deep fake uploaded on Facebook. It's now been taken down by the platform. But you see the problem here. AI tools are cheap and easily available. With their help, spreading dangerous fake news is easier than ever. And this problem is not limited to Bangladesh. We've seen deep fakes of Ukraine's president asking soldiers to surrender. Of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, calling for troop mobilization. And US President Joe Biden touching children inappropriately. All this in a non-election year. So imagine the situation in 2024. Dozens of elections are slated to be held this year. Chances are AI will play a big role. The question is, what will that role be? You can use AI to extend the reach of your campaign, yes. Maybe address more gatherings and events, or improve your campaign videos, or maybe release a speech from jail. That's what Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan did. He used an audio deep fake to address his supporters. You can also use AI to make attack ads, like this one published by the Republicans in the US. This just in, we can now call the 2024 presidential race for Joe Biden. This morning, an emboldened China invades Taiwan. Financial markets are in free fall as 500 regional banks have shuttered their doors. Border agents were overrun by a surge of 80,000 illegals yesterday evening. Officials closed the city of San Francisco this morning, citing the escalating crime and fentanyl crisis. Clearly, you can do a lot with AI. There's a flip side too. Fake speeches and fake news. They can make or break political campaigns, which is why it is important to understand the challenges. The first one is regulation. 
Should AI be allowed in campaigns at all? It's a question that the U.S. is grappling with. The Biden campaign has set up a special war room. Its only job is to tackle deep fakes. Separately, there is talk of banning AI in campaigns. A bipartisan bill is in the works. It seeks to ban the use of AI to deceive voters. I guess a middle ground is needed, something between a ban and the Wild West, meaning regulation. Challenge number two is technical. How do you identify a deep fake? Take a look at this video from Russia. See if you can identify the deep fake Putin. Vladimir Vladimirovich, здравствуйте. Я студент и учусь в Санкт-Петербургском государственном университете. Хочу спросить, правда ли, что у вас много двойников? И еще, как вы относитесь к тем опасностям, которые несет в нашу жизнь искусственный интеллект и нейросети? Спасибо. Can you tell which one was fake? That's the problem. Most people agree that deep fakes should be removed, but to do that, you must be able to identify them. Some companies are working on it, like Sony, Nikon, and Canon. They're trying to give each photo and video a digital signature, sort of like a birthmark. If a clip has that signature, it is real. If not, it is AI generated. Of course, this technology is yet to be refined. It could be years before it's rolled out. So my point is, there is no immediate easy solution. Deep fakes will keep getting better, and bad actors will keep using them. Yes, some of them will be fact-checked and busted, but you cannot fact-check the entire internet. In Bangladesh's case, deep fakes slipped under the radar. After all, it wasn't really a factor. With or without AI, Sheikh Hasina was always the favorite. But imagine a closely fought election, like Biden versus Trump. In such cases, AI could be the difference. As voters, all we can do is be vigilant. If a video looks fishy or out of character, double check. Go to trusted news providers and most importantly, do not mindlessly forward it to dozens of WhatsApp groups. Over to Malaysia now. A high stakes legal drama is unfolding there. McDonald's Malaysia versus BDS. First of all, what is BDS? It stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, BDS. Who does it target? Israel. BDS is a global movement of multiple stakeholders like trade unions, activists, churches and academic associations. Its job is to put economic pressure on Israel. Like promoting the boycott of Israeli businesses or asking banks to stop operations in the country. And why does BDS do this? They say they do this to help Palestinians, which brings us to the legal drama in Malaysia. It all started after the Hamas attack on Israel. McDonald's Israel, the McDonald's Israel franchise, offered free meals to Israeli soldiers. BDS was enraged. They accused McDonald's of supporting Israel's war. In Malaysia, it led to a boycott. Many customers stopped eating at McDonald's. They even had to lay off some workers which is why McDonald's Malaysia is now suing BDS. They say BDS made false and defamatory statements about McDonald's, so they want compensation. How much? More than $1 million. But honestly, this goes beyond the money. It raises a much larger question. The question of corporate boycotts. Before we get to that, let's look at some basic facts. McDonald's is not suing BDS, only McDonald's Malaysia is. And these are two different companies. McDonald's is licensed and run by a different company in Malaysia. And that firm is the one that is suing BDS. And this is an important distinction. Secondly, Malaysia is firmly pro-Palestine. In fact, forget pro-Palestine, Malaysia is pro-Hamas. Listen to what their prime minister said in October last year. As I've said, the whole issue is not uh, what happened uh, two weeks ago, but it's through what we, what we term as politics of dispossession. I mean, countries cannot continue to colonize another part of the uh, uh, Palestinian uh, lands. He says the Hamas attack is not an issue. Only Israeli settlements are a problem. I'm sure BDS would love him. The people, too, are firmly pro-Palestine. They eagerly boycotted McDonald's after October. So chances are this lawsuit will only backfire. It may trigger more backlash against McDonald's. But let's look at the larger picture. What should we make of BDS? We went on their website today. Look at the list of companies on their target list. 
Puma, HP, Volvo, Google, Amazon, Disney, Airbnb, Domino's, McDonald's, Burger King, JCB, and the list goes on. Now, these are everyday companies. You can't visit the BDS website unless you Google BDS. You can't order alternatives to Israeli products unless you go on Amazon. So the list itself is, is over-ambitious. And the strategies are over the top. Like in Amsterdam, shoppers were showered with pro-Palestine leaflets. Out of nowhere, take a look at this. Dear shoppers, welcome to Bainkorf. This Christmas season, we invite you to stop shopping while the bombs are dropping. Over 20,000 people in Gaza were killed this warm winter season, funded by your tax money. Great for pictures, but chances are the customers bought the stuff anyway. So the question is, what do these movements really achieve? Boycott movements had great success against South Africa's apartheid regime with Israel. It's been limited, though. And the reason is obvious. There was political will behind the first boycott. But in this case, in the case of Israel, that will is divided. There are enough people who support and oppose Israel. And you cannot build a global campaign like this, with this kind of division. Also, the idea is fundamentally flawed. Just think about it. Politicians are supposed to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict. Not just this war, but the root causes of it. Only they can make a difference, politicians, policymakers. But here the onus is being placed on ordinary people. We are being asked to not eat a pizza or order a Big Mac or not wear Puma shoes. As if that will stop Israel's war or bring a two-state solution. It won't. All it does is guilt trip ordinary people. And I'm not saying we should not hold companies accountable. I'm saying we need better ways to do that. Put pressure on governments instead. If politicians join your boycott, companies will follow. Just look at Joe Biden's policy change. At first, he was in full support of Israel. Then Muslim Americans started abandoning him. His polling numbers began to drop. So what did he do? He scaled back his position. He asked Israel to not target civilians. And that is the reality of our world. You cannot expect companies to double up as activists. They need to be pushed by governments. And speaking of boycotts, let's look at the country that seems to be boycotting common sense. Pakistan. The country is preparing for an election, though selection would probably be a more suitable term. What else would you call an election without an opponent? Pakistan's biggest opposition party is being barred from the contest. Their biggest names have been rejected by the country's election commission. This, of course, includes former Prime Minister Imran Khan and his top lieutenants. They're also being excluded by the poll body. The Pakistan Tehreek in Saaf, the PTI, says 90% of its candidates have been rejected. The election was always going to be a farce, but this is a new law even by Pakistan standards. Here's a report. There's election drama and then there's Pakistani election drama. A quick recap for those who haven't been following it. Pakistan goes to polls on February 8th. One of the most popular candidates for the Prime Minister's post is Imran Khan, the founder of the Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf Party or PTI. He was PM between August 2018 and April 2022. In 2022, Imran Khan was ousted from his premiership. It was a political coup of sorts, and he's been embroiled in one legal case after another ever since. Imran Khan hasn't been seen in public since August. He was jailed after being convicted in a corruption case. Later, that conviction was suspended, but Imran Khan has remained in prison nonetheless, awaiting trial for other offences. Many senior members of his party were also locked up. Some eventually came out of detention and renounced their allegiance to Imran Khan. Others who have stayed loyal have stayed locked up. Meanwhile, another former Pakistani Prime Minister is back in town, Nawaz Sharif. He was once imprisoned for corruption too. He was actually even given a lifetime ban from politics because of this. 
Later, he fled to London and stayed there citing medical issues. Nawaz Sharif returned to Pakistan last October and has proceeded to re-enter politics as though nothing ever happened. He has been appealing his old graft convictions and the courts have been acquitting him. Now to the twist. Last weekend, the country's political parties sent their candidate nominations to the Election Commission. The Commission's job was to scrutinize the paperwork and validate the candidates. You'll never guess what happened next. Apparently, 90% of the PTI candidates weren't deemed eligible to contest. This, of course, includes Imran Khan. He was going to contest from three different places, Lahore, Islamabad and his hometown, Miawali. Lahore and Miawali have rejected his candidature. There's no clarity on Islamabad, but there are high chances that it will reject him too. Why is Imran Khan being barred from contesting? His criminal conviction, apparently. He was convicted in a graft case in August. Along with that, he was barred from politics for five years. That's the reason Pakistan's election body refuses to accept his candidature, even though Imran Khan's conviction was suspended. Now, the problem arises when you look at Nawaz Sharif. He has been given a lifetime politics ban. It's currently being appealed, but as of today, it still stands. Despite this, the Pakistani election body accepted Nawaz Sharif's candidature. That too from Lahore, the same city that rejected Imran Khan. The nomination was challenged today. Now the courts will decide on Nawaz Sharif's candidature. But for Pakistan's election commission, it seems there are one set of rules for Nawaz Sharif and another for Imran Khan. And it doesn't end there. As we said, most of the PTI's top leaders have not been allowed to stand for reasons like missing certificates or other faulty paperwork. These people have all stood for and been elected to parliament in the past. You would think they know how to apply for the job again. But apparently not. It seems Pakistan is being railroaded into getting Nawaz Sharif back as Prime Minister. Democracy is about people's choice. But do the people of Pakistan really have one in this election? Let's tell you about the latest turn in the war in Ukraine. The fighting has intensified. Both Russia and Ukraine have ramped up attacks. On Friday, Moscow launched its biggest missile attack on Ukraine. On Saturday, Kiev attacked southwest Russia. 24 people were killed. And on New Year's Eve, Russia hit back. Another deadly attack on the city of Kharkiv. So it's been a period of intense strikes. But the front lines have hardly moved. Will 2024 change that? Here's a report. As the world welcomed the new year, fireworks lit up the sky everywhere. But in Ukraine's Kharkiv, it was missiles and not fireworks that lit up the sky. On Sunday, Russia struck Ukraine again. There were attacks across the country, but they were mostly concentrated in Kharkiv. What a gift Russia has given us for this new year. They have black souls. They bombed residential areas. There are people here. How can anyone do such a thing? So why did Moscow attack the city? Russia's defense ministry calls it a tit-for-tat strike. On Friday, Russia launched its biggest missile attack on Ukraine since the invasion. Several cities were attacked. 45 people were killed. It was deadly and Kyiv hit back. On Saturday, Ukraine attacked the city of Belgorod. This is a Russian border city, located in the country's southwest. They used drones to hit targets. The attacks killed 24 people. Among them, four were children. 100 more were injured. It was the deadliest attack on Russia since the war began. So a shocked Moscow immediately called a UN Security Council meet to discuss the strikes. I would like to ask a question. Does Ukraine also have the right to intentionally and non-selectively kill civilians? The representative of France, the permanent representative of France, says that Ukraine is protecting itself in accordance with Article 50 of the UN Charter. It's not for the military to bomb civilian infrastructure. Which brings us to the attacks yesterday on New Year's Eve. Moscow struck Kharkiv. It bombarded the city with missiles and drones. Missiles struck residential buildings, hotels and medical facilities. Russia called it a response to the Belgorod attacks. 
In the last few days, Russia and Ukraine have seen it all. Tit for tat strikes, accusations and counter accusations, denials about targeting civilian facilities. But their leaders remain steadfast. On New Year's Eve, Russian President Vladimir Putin addressed the nation. He didn't even mention Ukraine or Russia's so called special military operation. There was just praise for Russia's soldiers. Today I would like to address our military personnel, everyone who is at a combat post, at the forefront of the fight for truth and justice. You are our heroes. Our hearts are with you. We are proud of you and admire your courage. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky struck a more optimistic note. He highlighted the successes, the highs of the Ukrainian army, conveniently leaving out the setbacks. According to Zelensky, 2024 is Ukraine's year. Wars do not end by themselves. They are ended. And victory is not received or granted. It is gained. And to this end, today, we have to live by the rule. You either work or you fight. So, 22 months later, there has been no major breakthrough. Russia controls 18% of Ukraine, whose counteroffensive hasn't worked. So it's pretty much a stalemate. But as the latest strikes show, it's nowhere near over. Twenty twenty four has brought with it a new beginning for Mickey Mouse, Walt Disney's prodigal son, Disney's beloved mascot. Starting today, it is open season on the rodent. American law allows copyright to be held for 95 years. Mickey Mouse has crossed that limit, so it no longer belongs solely to the Walt Disney Company. For the first time, Mickey Mouse has entered public domain. But not all of it, just Mickey's earliest version. It has lost copyright protection. The steamboat Willie Mouse from the 1928 short film, it featured a non-speaking version of Mickey, it introduced the famed rodent to the world, made cinema history and saved Walt Disney, the American animator. He founded the entertainment conglomerate, the Disney Company. Before Mickey's release, Disney was at a low point. He was involved in a corporate dispute. He had lost rights to a character that he'd invented. And with it, most of his staff and money, he'd lost all of it. It was at this rock bottom that Disney came up with an idea. He got animators to draw it up and Mortimer came to life. Yes, that's what the mouse was named initially, Mortimer, until Disney's wife persuaded him to change it to a friendlier name. Then came Mickey Mouse and transformed the fortunes of Walt Disney. Within five years, Mickey's merchandise was raking in over $1 million a year. That's about $19 million in today's value. And now the Disney company is worth $171 billion, mostly thanks to Mickey's contributions over the last century. It is not just a TV cartoon character anymore. It is a crucial part of pop culture. Mickey is in books, on socks, mugs, even pillow covers. Reports say the character alone brings in about $6 billion every year from TV series, movies, merchandise and theme parks. And that last bit is important. Twelve theme parks are spread across America, Europe and Asia. Last year, they brought in over $32 billion in revenue. World leaders love them. So do children. After all, Mickey is the only rodent parents let their children get close to. Mickey hasn't just made money for Disney. It has launched entire careers. In the 1950s, Disney released the Mickey Mouse Club. The hit television variety show, it launched stars like Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears and Ryan Gosling. Market researchers say the character of Mickey Mouse is even more well-known than Santa Claus. So in many ways, Mickey is the ultimate symbol of intellectual property, which puts Disney in a bit of a mousetrap. With no copyright over the character, anyone can use it without permissions or cost. And what does this mean for Disney? Winnie the Pooh can offer a window into what might happen. Pooh is another Disney property. It came into public domain last year and an upstart filmmaker made a low-budget slasher film. It was jarring to see a kid-favorite bear turn into an R-rated feral killer. Will we see a bloodthirsty Mickey Mouse next? Well, no one knows yet. But remember, for now only one copyright is expiring. It includes the original version of Mickey, the one with a rat-like nose, pupil-less eyes and a long tail. 
unlike the later versions where the mouse is rounder, it wears red shorts and white gloves. That's the Mickey Mouse we know today. It may enter the public domain over the coming decades, so would Popeye, King Kong, Donald Duck and Superman. But not today. So for now, there is an animated line here. Only the old Mickey can be shown without Disney's permission. No one can touch the other versions. If they do, a dirty legal battle is expected and there is nothing Disney takes more seriously than intellectual property. In 2020, Disney charged an elementary school $250 because they showed The Lion King without permission at a fundraiser. In 2006, Disney forced a Florida daycare center to remove an unauthorized Mickey Mouse mural because carving the character into a child's gravestone violated the copyright. In 1971, an underground comic book artist showed Mickey Mouse smuggling drugs. Disney dragged him through the court for eight years. There is nothing soft and cuddly about how Disney protects its characters. Except now, Disney does not have a copyright law to protect itself. One can almost picture the Disney company embodying Mickey and saying, what a hot dog day. For our last story, let me ask you a question. Do you know what is the most searched question about our universe? It is this one. What are black holes? It's a mystery that has haunted mankind for ages. And the more we know, the more there is to know. So this new year, India has launched a new space mission. It will study black holes. It's the second such space mission of its nature. The first one was launched in 2021 by NASA. And this isn't ISRO's only mission this year. It's just the beginning, in fact. It has several missions lined up, including test flights for its first manned mission called Gaganyaan. Our next report tells you more. 2023 was a year of many things. The year of two wars. The year of artificial intelligence. The year of weight loss drugs. But for India, 2023 was a little extra special. It's the year we went to the moon. 2023 was all about the success of India's moon landing. And it looks like 2024 has more lined up, like ISRO's ExpoSat. It's an X-ray polarimeter satellite. ExpoSat launched on Monday from the Sri Harikota spaceport. It's a rocket that's carrying an observatory. What will it do? It will study black holes. The mission costs around $30 million. It's the second of its kind in the world. The first was in 2021. It was by NASA. India is launching its own now, and it's to understand how black holes work. And it's important too, because black holes are one of the most fascinating objects in space. They have intense gravity, so much so that neither matter nor light can escape it. Scientists believe they are formed when a massive star dies, as in it collapses under its own gravity. The star becomes so dense that it wraps the fabric of space and time, turning into what we know as black holes. That said, there's often a common misconception, and it's that black holes suck things in. They don't. Black holes are just like any other thing in space. In fact, you can get surprisingly close to it, like a few hundred kilometers almost. For example, if you replace the sun we know with a black hole, our Earth won't get sucked into it. Neither will any other planet. They will just continue revolving as they are now. But black holes are still challenging to study. That's because they are virtually unseeable, which makes India's mission an ambitious one. It's also very crucial. We know what black holes are, but we don't know its origin story. Also, could studying them unlock the secrets of the universe, aka what the beginning of time looked like? So, black holes can unlock a lot of puzzles about the universe's existence, about how they came into being, about why they are different in size. So, studying them is an important mission. But it isn't India's only mission in 2024. There are 12 of them. And a crucial one is Gaganyaan-1. It is India's manned mission to take astronauts into space in 2025. And the test flight could be in the first quarter of 2024. Then there is Mangalyaan-2, India's sequel to its first successful Mars mission. There's also Shukrayaan-1, a spacecraft which will orbit Venus for five years. So it'll be a busy year for India's space agency. Last year, we aimed for the moon. This year, we are aiming further. 
And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Istanbul, thousands gathered in support of Palestinians. In Nepal, porridge, watermelon and sugarcane were on the menu for a feast of, for elephants. And Hong Kong brings in the new year with its biggest fireworks display till date. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1959. Fidel Castro seized power in Cuba. This was after dictator Fulencio Batista fled the country. Batista's regime was uh, toppled by rebel forces led by Castro. He entered Havana with supporters greeting him a week after the rebellion. Leaving you on that note, thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. See the campesinos with their machetes, their straw hats, pigeons flying, let loose thousands of them as Fidel Castro came in.